Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Wellbe Show and Podcast. I am very excited to have a guest with me today, Jessica Flanagan. She's a clinical nutritionist and the author of The Loving Diet, a book I recently read all about loving your way out of a lot of bad things. I'll let her explain more. But anyway, Jessica, welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. I have so many questions for you having read this and because I think it's so relevant at the moment for people going through any negative experience or negative feelings, whatever that might be. And I know that you specialize in helping people with autoimmune conditions to heal through food and obviously through this other mind-body component. So yeah. would you mind just explaining really fast what the Loving Diet is and how it came to be? Um, it is a how-to book to learn how to be with our circumstances differently. And from my perspective, it's learning how to love the parts inside of ourselves that hurt. Illness is one opportunity to do that. All the circumstances that we have in our life, whether they be financial disaster, relationship, hardships, personal struggle, um, all of those are opportunities to see you know, what we're being asked to awaken to. And so for me, the loving diet was really born out of my own struggle of my life falling apart. I mean, it fell apart as pretty as complete as a life could fall apart. Um, my marriage broke up. Uh, we lost our house. You know, we had to move. Uh, I became the primary caretaker of a child, you know, and so I, those were my circumstances. And I had to decide through those circumstances if I wanted life to work for me or against me. Um, and so the same is true when we're looking at chronic disease or anything that seems to be, you know, what we would call a problem or an issue. I see the opportunity there. Great. Thank you for that explanation. And now would you mind explaining a bit like sort of why you focus on autoimmune conditions and what autoimmune conditions are compared to other kinds of chronic disease and whether there's anything different about that healing process? There's nothing different. So autoimmune disease is just the wheelhouse that I worked out of, of, you know, oh, there's an opportunity here. What is your autoimmune disease here to awaken you to? So from that perspective, it's applicable for everybody. I personally got into it because I have an identical twin and she was diagnosed with two autoimmune diseases. And because I had been a nutritionist for so many years um, and so many people are dealing with autoimmune disease in her own effort to find a path, a healing path that worked for her. Um, I switched over my private practice to uh, deal primarily with women with chronic autoimmune illness. It's shifted and changed since then. Um, I still work primarily with women with autoimmune disease, but I've moved out of the restrictive diet or using a restrictive diet to heal um, and more into gut restoration. Great. I was going to ask you another question related to the autoimmune paleo diet, because that is definitely a, not a big part of your book, but that's kind of a part of it. You know, I'm sure that there are some people who will watch this that either don't have an autoimmune disease or have one or have some symptoms of autoimmunity, right? Hashimoto's or, you know, even if it's mild and they don't consider themselves having a full-blown disease, but that are, have never heard of doing the autoimmune paleo diet or haven't done it. So can you sort of explain why you, you know, incorporated that into the loving diet and maybe also now why it's not exactly what you, you know, prescribe for your clients? So loving ourselves doing hard things doesn't have a shelf life but all diets do. And so the diet component in my book is very specific for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or what I call SIBO and autoimmune disease. So that is definitely not gonna apply to everybody, but for people who do do the short-term autoimmune paleo diet and need a SIBO diet in relation to them also having an autoimmune disease, the diet works great for very short-term applications. But the uh, the mind-body piece is something that every single thing that I put in the book is something that I've used myself for where places where I've struggled. So if you struggle uh, in any way, there's components of the book that you can apply. And so when I started to, my life started to fall apart, I had been meditating. I had been doing yoga. I was class parent. 
I was a prominent member of my community. I volunteered. I checked off every single box that I thought would be what I'm supposed to do. And then I found out that when my life, the rug really got ripped out from underneath me, I did not have the skills. I did not know even what the first step would be. And so I wrote the book really for anybody who is trying to figure out how can I use what feels like it, my life is being torn apart as uh, something that is for me instead of against me. And I have found that that is just not a path that a lot of people are that is widely taught. We're taught that the better your life looks, the better you will be able to cope when things fall apart. <laughs> I would totally agree with that. I think a lot of us, especially in the wellness space, are doing a lot of things that we think check all the boxes. And at the core of it, you just, your, your gut intuition is so strong and there's so little time for people to check in with it. Like, I just can't stress enough how important that is and how impactful it's been on me when I actually take the time. But I so rarely take the time because life is just one big, you know, to-do list. And I think a lot of people feel that way. So I want to ask you one more question related to autoimmunity, which is that, and I don't know if this is true, but I'm curious, the fact that autoimmunity means that your body is kind of attacking itself, right? Do you believe that people who suffer from autoimmune conditions, they have this other emotional, mental, spiritual blockage that might be driving the physical? Do you know what I mean? Because when a body is physically attacking itself, to me, it's, it's also a bit of a symptom of like an internal struggle or an internal disharmony. So yes, it is true that uh, actually when we have hard things that have happened to us, we know now the science is there that it's an issue. And that, and the study I'm gonna to refer to is a huge study that was done by Kaiser called the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. And what that showed is that um, humans who go through difficulty earlier in life have a higher propensity for a chronic disease. So what that means is, is that, for instance, if you had an alcoholic parent, if you didn't have a, uh, like a regular place to live, shelter, if you had child abuse, molestation, all of those things um, are adverse experiences. And the more adverse experiences that people have, almost like a, a number, then the more likely they are to have a chronic disease. Autoimmune being one of the chronic diseases uh, that we can have. You know, there's many that we have that we can choose from. Okay, interesting. What made you switch from, you know, really prescribing this autoimmune paleo diet piece to just rebuilding the gut? Because we talk a lot about gut health at Wellbe. Um, it's a big focus. And I'm always curious when other people are working on it too, and kind of how that came to be. I've had thousands of people in my practice who have gone on that restrictive diet. And what I found after actually being on the front lines and seeing so many people talking to so many people was a couple of things. One is that a lot of people from a very innocent, well-meaning place took a diet that was meant to be a temporary elimination diet and they turned it into a lifestyle. So they took a diet that was not meant to last for more than a few months and they were on it for two years, three years, four years. And what I saw was, was that in the effort to reduce inflammation, put themselves into remission, clean up their gut, that big things got missed. So when we go on a restrictive diet and we don't look at all the co-infections, uh, for instance, bacterial infections, parasites, viruses that make the gut leaky, um, we only do the restrictive diet, uh, then a couple of things happen. One is, is that they lose diversity in their gut. And when we lose diversity in the gut over time, that's going to impact the immune system negatively. So essentially, when we have a loss of tolerance issue, a loss of tissue tolerance, which is what autoimmune disease is, we don't clean up the gut, and then we go on a restrictive diet. It is a perfect storm for getting locked into not being able to reintroduce foods because then the body loses tolerance to the healthy foods on the autoimmune paleo diet. 
So I started to see a startling, startling amount of women who started to get disordered eating. They became frightened and afraid of food because then any food that they looked at, even foods that are autoimmune paleo approved like carrots, chicken, uh, they started to react to and they started to become afraid that they were gonna eat the wrong food and that they were gonna mess up. So they became scared of food, healthy food even became the enemy. And unless they kept a very tightly controlled diet or list of foods, then they might flare. And then there's a lot of shame related to that, which is a, a lot of shame related to strength. Oh, you must not really care about curing, curing or putting your autoimmune disease into remission because you should be able to do this simple thing, which is just go on a healthy restrictive diet in order to heal this. And what I found is, is that over time, it's very hard for people to be on a very restricted diet, which a lot of people are upset about. But I come out and say this because there's a lot of people silently suffering. There are thousands of people silently suffering, saying, oh, I have to choose pleasure and socializing and community around my food and creativity or being involved and in being willing to heal my gut dysbiosis and put myself into remission. That's a hard thing to come up against. Yes. I'm so glad you're bringing this up because I have seen a shift. You know, I've been interviewing people for uh, three years for Wellbe, and you know the earliest experts I was talking to and and stories of health recovery it really was around this like take all the bad stuff out. I mean, obviously it was also about food being medicine, but it was a, a big focus on like get rid of the gluten, get rid of the dairy, get rid of the sugar, you know, all, all of that. And that might still be true for people with certain conditions. But in the last couple of months, I've interviewed a couple of people that have made me think the tide is shifting towards this focus on gut diversity and diversity of foods and how if you're taking something away like a nightshade vegetable for example right like this is still a vegetable there's still new wonderful nutrients and minerals and vitamins in it the good bacteria in your gut that feed on that begin to die so it's like this interesting yes you're solving one problem but you're sort of creating another and especially with the focus on immunity following coronavirus there's just been so much interest in the well-being community around, you know, strengthening that gut lining and strengthening your gut health and things like that. So I'm glad to hear you're seeing what I'm seeing and that that's how your practice has evolved. But at this point, I want to shift and ask you a lot more questions about the mind-body stuff because it's so interesting and it's so hard. So anything you can do to help people like you have with your clients that are in the well-being audience with this, I think the better. So as I said, your book really resonated with me. I actually have very mild Hashimoto, so I do have an autoimmune condition, but I don't think of myself as like fighting a disease or that I have this bad relationship with it. You know, I, I don't really feel that I have that, but I do have other things in my life right now that I was feeling a lot of againstness. And I read the concept of againstness in your book. So I would love if you would explain that and talk about how people without a disease can apply the loving diet to their lives. You know, it's, it is uh, tricky because a lot of times when we start asking ourselves, well, what do we have againstness to? There's more than one answer. When I start talking to my students about this, the first thing that I talk about is really what's the relationship that you have to those circumstances. And so I love how when you were saying like, you know, oh, my Hashimoto's, you know, the first question is, is, well, what's your relationship to your Hashimoto's? And so oftentimes when we start asking a question, what I tell my clients is first, see what it feels like to become curious, curious about whatever it is that you're grappling with. Um, the second thing is, is looking at what the relationship is that you have to your circumstances. And so oftentimes, just doing those two things. First, oh, is there a downside for me being curious about my lupus? Is there a downside to me being curious about me losing my job? So the first thing is, is become curious. And then the second thing is, is ask yourself what the relationship is that you have. There hasn't been a time that when I've presented it in that kind of format, um, but it doesn't provide some kind of information for people to use it in a way that it starts loosening. 
so once, you know, let's just say I'm going to use like a family member I was having a fight with. So can I be curious about, um, about that, that argument, I guess, or that person, I suppose. And then I'm just making sure that it's really clear from me so that other people can be really clear on it too. And then, you know, what's my relationship to that person or to that relationship, I guess, is that sort of how you would yeah. So the third question would be, what did you decide? So the first thing is, is become curious. The second thing is, is ask yourself what the relationship to it is. And then the third thing is, is what did you decide? And oftentimes when we look at, you know, like an argument that we have with somebody, what we decided is where we are able to discern if there's anything that's not true or a misunderstanding that we're holding you know, the, at the root of the disruption. And this can be physical, or this could be something as simple as getting into an argument with a family member. And so oftentimes when we ask that, we will, you know, have something else come up. Like, what did, well, what did you decide? Well, I decided that God's punishing me with this illness. Or, you know, there's always just going to be a lot of family drama in my house, and that's just the burden that we all have to face. Or one big one is, is about safety and loving, you know, which is at the core of who I am. I'm not a lovable person. And so as we get into arguments with other people, you know, one of the things that I see a lot, which is they decided that they're not lovable. Okay. That's really interesting. So now I want to ask you questions about this shift into loving it, because I think it's so challenging and I'm going to. I'm just going to use myself as an example because I was trying to do it in, from you know what I read in your book and just kind of say, okay, so I'm following these three steps. What did I decide about this relationship with this family member? Like, I, I, it's actually sort of similar to what you just said, sort of a, well, we're just, there's just always going to be this chasm. We're never going to understand each other. And I may as well just like not speak while I'm here or you go somewhere else because there's just like no other way to deal with it. You know, that's kind of like the story that I told myself or what I decided. Now, how do you shift out of that? How do you shift into this loving your way through it? Well, we're simplifying it down here in this interview. So, and, you know, I have to make room for the fact that, you know, relationships are incredibly complex, but when, as we're talking and we're just kind of riffing about it, I'd say too, is that, is there any place that it feels like it's not safe for you to speak? or that your voice doesn't matter, or that you know, what you contribute to the family dynamic isn't as important as what other people are contributing. And so of course I'm making that up, not knowing much about the situation, but that's sort of like the avenues where we can go in to find out uh, where and if you have any misunderstandings in relation. So getting into the disagreement with the family members then becomes a way to look and reflect about any misunderstandings that you hold about yourself that's not true. And so it's actually not true that it's not safe to speak. It just feels like it's not safe to speak in relation to the dynamic that you're talking about. And so from that point, once I figure out with my clients or my students um, in relation to their illness, their relationship to food, their relationship to others or work, then I go in and we use self-forgiveness to help clear up any kind of misunderstandings. And so it would be something as simple as I forgive myself for believing that I can't trust my voice. I forgive myself for believing that it's not safe to speak what my truth is into the world. Does that make sense? It does. When I read your book and saw that your ex-husband had left you and created this seriously horrible trauma in your life and that you went from not only from, I'm sure, hating him and grieving to forgiving him and then actually having a good relationship with him and his new spouse or partner. I just, that was so impressive. So how do you really advise people? And I know this is a shorter interview and people should really grab your book who want to go deeper, but whether it's a disease that they're healing and they feel, you know, againstness towards their own body or a family argument, or even how the negativity they might feel around everything going on in the world with 
racism and riots and all of the things that are going on. People are feeling this againstness and negativity. And you've just identified how you kind of figure out what the root issues are, right? And then how do you work through to the loving them part? Because that is, to me, such a jump. Well, it's a risk. So in my case, my suffering was so horrible and nothing else was working. So I got to the point where I was willing to take a risk to consider that there was something for me in my experience of my life falling apart. And see what happens is, is oftentimes we have our life falls apart, right? In one way or another, either through a diagnosis or like something like my husband cheating on me and leaving me and then ending up marrying that woman by the perspective that I took that my life wasn't for me, which was a lot. And, you know, I went through the normal process of grieving and suffering. I kept reinforcing that, uh, that misunderstanding that I had held true, which was, I was an unlovable person. And so, uh, when finally I had realized that that wasn't working, that maybe I needed to just trust my life. And, and so what happened was, was that by taking the risk and voting for myself, that there was something in this horrible experience for me, I had to surrender my position that life was against me. And see, that's really scary because that puts you at a really vulnerable place. And for me, what it did was it meant that I had to admit to myself that I was no better than my husband, even though these things had happened, even though I felt wronged, even though I felt like I had so much taken away. And it was incredibly vulnerable and it was painful. It was very painful. Um, But what happened was, was that as I kept voting for myself and saying, I wonder if there's here something here for me that see, see, I got curious. So when I got curious about, oh, I wonder in this disaster, um, I could learn how to be with the parts that are hurting so horribly. I had to be vulnerable to do that. I had to be curious to do it. I had to give up my position. And I just gave myself the time and literally took it minute by minute. But what happened was, was that the grief became less overwhelming. And so I was able to be a little bit more present in my life. And the only way that I knew that this kind of vulnerability path, this self-compassion path worked, was that it felt true inside of myself. But I had to risk a lot. I had to risk my position of I'm right and he's wrong and I'm the victim and he's the perpetrator. And so I had to give all that up. And that was probably one of the scariest things I've ever done. Okay, so you risked that. You went through the very painful process of giving that up. And then what did the other side look like of that? What did that, you know, it, it's, I'm sure you didn't just find love for him and his new wife overnight, you know, like how, how do you get through that kind of like tunnel and into the light? Well, the first thing I did was I stopped judging how I was handling the situation. And so for instance, let's just, you know, make an ex- example of this. I remember going to Whole Foods. I think I talked about this in the book. And I was so grief stricken and felt so much like poor me, you know, why did my husband have to cheat on me and leave me? You know, I felt like it was like a soap opera. And so what happened was, was that I kept judging my sadness. Why can't you just get through this? Why can't you just get through your grief? But what changed it was, was I remember going into Whole Foods one day and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to be with myself sad. That was the key. I had never allowed myself to be present in a non-judgmental way with the parts of myself that were sad, the parts of myself that were grieving. I actually had to do visualizations and hold her hand. I laid down when I was meditating or I would go to bed and I would hold her hand and I would say, you're doing such a great job. You're doing such a great job. I know it's so scary and this is terrifying but you're doing amazing and I'm right here with you. That was a thing I had never done before. I was too busy judging him, her, (laughs) my life, you know, like wanting people to hate them. You know, I was doing all the human things, but I just stopped judging my humanness and I stopped trying to be a superstar when really I was just on the ground, you know, inch by inch. I love that. So as that applies to healing something, it's not 
trying to judge yourself, you know, you didn't take good enough care of yourself. Like that's why your disease is worse or you must've just, you're, you know, the victim of bad genes. And so that's why this happened. Or, you know, you can come up with a lot of different reasons, depending on how much you hate yourself. You could say it's, you know, all your fault or your parents' fault or whatever that is. So just getting totally away from that and just holding the hand of that patient, you know, and saying, it's okay that you are struggling with this illness. This is hard, you know? Yeah. And then moving through to loving it, which you're going to have to tell me more about because I think it is incredibly hard. (laughs) Well, the piece too that we want to add in is, is that just being present with the parts inside of us that ache and hurt and coming to the realization that those places don't need to be fixed, that just being present with them, it's like little children that go outside and they're riding their bike and they fall down and they skin their knee and they go in. And so what does the mom do? She patches up, she cleans up the wound and she sits with them and says, oh my gosh, honey, I'm so sorry. You just fell off that bike. It's so hard when we fall off our bikes. It's scary. She's not fixing anything. She's just being present with the the child that's hurting until they get ready and they're like, okay, I'm going to go back out. I'm going to go back out on that bike. That is exactly what I'm suggesting here as a effective healing model that is almost not ever done in the healing communities. Being with the parts that hurt instead of fixing them. So I'm sure somebody would think, well, I want to reverse this disease or I want to put this into remission. Isn't that fixing it? You know, like how, how do you differentiate between wanting to just improve and, you know, try to get your body better or the situation better while also not trying to fix it? Yeah, letting go of outcomes is very hard work. <laughs> so it's scary because you have to be vulnerable that you know, that I'm going to trust my life. And so I'm just going to keep investing and trusting and not keep control of what it's going to look like. And that's freedom. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense to me. So, you know, for people that are wanting to, maybe it's just a symptom, you know, maybe it's not a full blown disease, but they're just like, I'm sick of having this, you know, chronic acid reflux or whatever. Like I, I just want to be done with this or somebody who's been sick for 20 years or somebody listening to this, who's just a self you know, interested in improving their health, but you know, doesn't have anything in particular going on. You've talked about how you start, right? This curiosity and this, you know, moving through this trusting experience. And then what do you do to harness this love, which is the end part or, so, or is the next step, I, th- I believe. When we start moving into this world of using a diet to reduce inflammation, that's not inherently the issue. Those are all practical pieces. So we want to be really practical, right? That's like wearing a mask in COVID. That's practical. Going on an anti-inflammatory diet, if you have an inflammatory disease, that's practical, But what's happening is, is that we're moving from using all of these resources that we have to being from practical into safety. And that's the biggest thing that I hope everybody gets out of this is, is that when we get curious, we look at what we decided, we look at the relationship that we have, those are steps that we can start to discern. Am I searching for how to be safe? in a diet because I'm scared of dying and I'm scared of what might happen or am I being practical and I'm using my loving as the measure of safety. And that when we look at what we want the end stage to be there, I think that that's um, something that is really understandable. And that that oftentimes happens in it, you know, inadvertently is that something scary happens to us. We go and we look at how the quickest way we can get safe again. So we start going outside of ourselves to fix it. And then we think, oh, now I'm safe. And loving ourselves doing hard things or the loving diet is really a perspective of knowing that we have the tools built inside of us because we were born on this planet to love ourselves struggling or to love ourselves or just simply create space 
to be with the parts of ourselves that are struggling or suffering or scared is enough. And that, it, that we don't need to look outside of ourselves for the safety because we have it right inside of us that creating room is enough. Okay. All right. I think I'm starting to get it. So when you have this safety, when you have this, finally you come to this place where you, you love yourself and you know that you're enough, no matter what you're struggling with, you detach from the outcomes. I'm just still so curious about how you then create this love, like real love for an illness that has ruined your life or an ex-husband that has you know, upended your life. And how do you cultivate that for this other? Well, first is, is that that's, you know, we're kind of rushed to an end place where we can maybe not love our disease, but we can say, oh, that I can see how that's helped me. I can see how that's awakened me. Um, and, and oftentimes it's as simple as, oh, this illness has awakened me to the parts inside of myself that were hurting. And I know now how to go be with the parts of myself that hurt. From my perspective, what loving ourselves is has been distilled down to being happy all the time, to like, you know, just this blind love. I don't see it like that. You know, and so in some ways, I think we have to redefine what loving ourselves means. For me, loving myself means is that there isn't any place I can't go be with myself. And I'm willing to not judge those places that I find when I find them. That's loving. Then I'm going to accept all the places, no matter how broken they seem, no matter how angry they seem. I'm going to go be with those places. To me, that's what being loving is. Okay. And so, I mean, I'm sure the first couple of times that you, once you had this realization and started to do this work that you interacted, you know, with your ex-husband, like you weren't immediately like, I love you. I'm so happy to see you. You know, I'm sure there was a transition there, but I know that now, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you have a good relationship and you guys are very much in each other's lives. So what was that journey like? Well, what happened was, was that, and I'm very thankful for this experience, <clears throat> was that when this all happened, the first thing I did was I would never do that to anybody. I would never hurt anybody like he has just hurt me. I would never, you know, I had my laundry list of how much better I was than him. And, you know, and he's just a horrible person because he willingly caused harm. And, you know, anyway, I had my whole, a whole speech about it. And then what happened was, was that I, through a series of experiences that I had, that I realized that there was nothing about myself that was above him. There was nothing about the experience that I have where I could elevate myself. And the moment that I realized that I'm no better than him and that I, under the right circumstances, might do exactly what he did, then I realized that I couldn't hold on to that position that I had anymore. And I called him and I said, I forgive you for everything. I'm not any better than you. And I realized that I have it inside of me to do exactly what you did. And I have been putting myself on a platform thinking I was better than you. And that was the very first step that I took. And that healed a lot between us. And it was really hard, really vulnerable because I got, I'd gotten so mad and I wanted him to be wrong so badly. So I, because if he was wrong, I would suffer less. But what happened was, was that that did not lessen my suffering. The only thing that lessened my suffering was being truthful with myself that I have it inside of me to do exactly what he had done to me and not judging her. And then that I was able to forgive him. That is so powerful. And I'd love to think about that process you worked through with him with the coming to terms of who you are and this extreme vulnerability and then this forgiveness as it relates to health issues. Explain how you would do that if it was a disease and not, a, not an ex-husband. <laughs> So there might be something for everybody in their circumstances. So that would be the first thing is, is that 
we're practical, um, we cooperate, we're going to go through the experience, you know, that life is giving us. But then when we start become curious and saying, I wonder as hard and grueling and scary and frightening that this experience is, is there something for me in it? And when we start asking ourselves this question, it opens up an entire line of inquiry of the universe being able to support us in a completely different way. And then of course there's, I would imagine there's the process of being extremely vulnerable and forgiving your disease. I think a lot of people I know who've been sick want to be the victim of or blame the disease or, you know, it's this terrible thing that's like disrupted their lives and having to turn all of that around and be vulnerable to say, thank you to the disease and thank you for coming into my life to teach me these things and help me grow. And it's not that I'm the victim of you. That's, that's wild. That's incredible. Oftentimes that will happen after people have an experience inside themselves of how whatever their circumstances here is to awaken them to. So for instance, it might be, you know, oh, I had lupus. And when I started to ask myself, lupus, what are you here to awaken me to? What are you here to awaken my life to? That when they start going through that inquiry, that's going to be a curriculum that's unique for each person. But that maybe they saw that they were compromising in their relationships. Lupus helped them understand how they compromised, how that they were living a less than life, that lupus helped awaken them to that. And so then there would be the piece where they might have gratitude. Oh, lupus helped me start advocating for myself because I never did before because I, I didn't think I was worth it. Those are the kinds of things that we're starting to look for. That's how life can work for us instead of against us. It's like a present wrapped up in, you know, the box called lupus. I'm sure so many people right now are like, what? But I mean, I think that hopefully they get the point of what you're saying. I actually remembered that I interviewed a girl, a health recovery story from Crohn's disease, full remission, um, off, you know, very intense drugs they told her she'd be on the rest of her life and she told me that your book was really helpful for her to stop judging her disease for stop hating it for stop you know for stopping to uh, it helped her to stop feel like a victim and to really embrace it and thank it that it shifted this path for her um, I think she now works also with private clients in nutrition and she you know didn't have that on her roadmap before. Um, and it really just opened her eyes to living a healthier lifestyle in general that her family did not have any of. So it really just shifted, you know, and she said, thank you, Crohn's, you may have helped me save a lot of my family members by introducing a different way of eating and things like that. So I just remember thinking that was really powerful. So I wanted to tell you that. But I also just want to go over before we wrap up, I can't believe, you know, we already have to because this is such an interesting topic to me. But what would you say are really the most effective tools for learning to love the worst things in your life, whether that's a disease or an ex-husband or really anything? Taking the position that there's something for you, asking yourself, you know, what would happen if I fully cooperate with my circumstances? That's a really big one. And starting to make an assessment about that. You know, and so for instance, deciding, you know, if you want to, if you want to look at how well you're cooperating with your circumstances, um, then what that's going to do is also show you where you're sourcing out of lack or abundance. And so, oh, poor me. I just got diagnosed. Why is life so unfair? That's a very human, normal thing to go through. But when we look at, you know, that's also a lack perspective. One of the ways that we can transform it into an abundance perspective is, oh, what's it here to awaken me to? And so a lot of it is, is just this internal dialogue. What kind of questioning are you doing in regards to the circumstances of your life? That's a good one. And that takes, that's a, a, a tool of transformation, but we also have to keep investing there because, you know, this world is sort of like a negative world. 
And so we have to keep showing up and taking that risk. So yeah, that's kind of what I meant by tools. I know that things that you can ask yourself and things that you can say to yourself are tools, but you know, are there any like activities that you feel are really effective in doing this work? Because I know you have to keep doing it for this to stick. Whether is it, I don't think it is, but is it meditation? Is it just sitting quietly with your eyes closed? Is it journaling? Like what, what ways have you seen your own clients and then yourself have these breakthroughs? Because I think there's very little time and people make very little space for being alone in themselves with enough time to have some of these breakthrough thoughts and realizations. Yeah. And so if you don't really set these things aside and use the medium that works best for you, whatever that might be, and maybe you can give some advice on that, it's very hard for these things to actually work. There's lots of ways to do it. So journaling, getting a healthcare team that takes this position that there's something here for you in the midst of so much struggle. Having a great therapist that takes this position, body work, you know, um, meditating, setting aside time to do all of this, you know, so that I have no magic toolkit ideas, except to say that there's uh, many of them that work. And a lot of it is just finding a style that resonates with you. Okay. Yeah. I think the hardest thing for people today is finding that time to be alone with your thoughts and not just running through a to-do list or you know, like, oh, I remember I forgot to do that. Or like, I really need to tell that person when I get home. It's constant. And it, I think, takes a lot of strength to sit quietly or go into a place where you allow yourself to go deep into this work and into these thoughts and not just let your, you know, executive function, as they call it, you're just like, I need to do that. I need to do this. You know, like all your little thoughts that run through your head all day take over. And let's not wait until those little thoughts are gone because they're always going to be present. They're serving us in some way. Um, and so that's the other thing is, is that, okay. And, you know, and so that in the midst of all of the negative self-talk, you can create time to talk to yourself differently. And we live in a world where there's so much pressure for it to be a perfect way that we only love ourselves when all the other negative stuff is removed from my perspective, being with ourself and voting for ourself and taking those risks, that is in the midst of all of that, still doing that and loving myself even with the negative self-talk, that's the key from my perspective. Because I'm still negative. I still judge myself. You know, I don't walk around on this um, love myself cloud. What I've determined though is, is that there isn't any place that is unlovable inside of me. And that's one of the m most effective models I've found. So my last question on that, and you just kind of touched on it, what are the things that make you fall back into judgment, into, you know, not loving your way through a negative situation? Are there any things that stick out to you? Well, I live with four teenage girls, so. <laughs> oh my gosh. That in itself is, you know, a sink full of dishes, piles of laundry, you know, people leaving their shoes everywhere, for sure. I mean, I, you know, I, it's, a, it's a constant balance, but I'm not so quick to judge myself as I used to be. And so I think that that's how I sort of see the progress inside of myself. I don't put so much pressure on myself for it to look a certain way. And that's been really helpful because, hey, we live here and lots of stuff happens and we're, we all get triggered. So might as well stop trying to prevent all the triggers and start investing more in when I get triggered, I know how to be with myself in a different way. I like that. All right. Well, my very last question for you that I ask all wealthy experts and interview subjects has to do with your, I mean, you've spoken a lot about what you do for yourself on the, the mind body side, and maybe your answer would be, you know, something you've already mentioned, but it's how do you get well be because get well be is you know the name of my platform and it really embodies the idea of like these things that you do for yourself so that you get and stay well every day that no matter if you're traveling you're busy you're stressed no matter what you don't miss these things or you find that you're really off what are these couple of things for you 
I get well be by saying one nice thing to myself a day. You know, I get well be by saying one nice thing to another person each day and allowing that to be sort of the model that I work out of. I love that. Would you mind sharing what you said to yourself today? <laughs> this is scary, but you can do it. That's the thing that I said to myself today. Thank you so much, Jessica. This yeah, has been really you. enlightening. And I hope that my audience, whoever is watching this, really takes something from it and you know grabs your book and sets this time aside to really think through how they respond to negativity in their lives or traumas or things that are, you know, againstness, as you, as you put it, and just really to see, are they fighting internal battles, whether it's physical, whether it's an autoimmune condition or some other chronic disease thing, or whether it's just an emotional, spiritual, mental battle that creates this resistance all day, every day, which is so unhealthy and is the root cause of we know so many then physical health issues, but also just a lifetime of suffering instead of trusting and being happy and finding a way to be loving. So I think anybody watching this will get a lot out of it if they actually take the time to reflect and look at their own behaviors and their own internal beliefs and all of that. So I know I plan to set aside some time today, actually, since I just finished your book last night, to do that and just let whatever comes, come, you know, not judge it and um, really think about the things in my life that I can learn from that, you know, aren't necessarily positive. So thank you for helping me do that. And hopefully a lot of other people listening to this 